attention, Duke Masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Missile Command, Martial Law, and Future Dead Cops. Plus this day in history with Jimmy Carter's UFO Report and our Song of the Day by Rostam on your Morning Monarchy for September 18th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to wherever you are for another week of listener-supported media. Streaming live, MediaMonarchy.com slash listen and brought to you by you at MediaMonarchy.com slash support. As I like to say, if you can give a palito, I can give a palato. MediaMonarchy.com slash support has the Bitcoin, the post office box, the PayPal, the Patreon, and a huge thanks to all our patrons. That's what keeps us going and growing. Ah, it's my favorite time of the year. This is the time where summer goes away and we finally get a little rain back in the Pacific Northwest. And what is it right now? Oh, baby, it's only 56 degrees. This is my favorite time of the year. Hopefully you'll kind of hear my, my smile turn up a bit. Hopefully you had a fantastic weekend. We dodged a little bit of the rain. We did a little bit of shopping. Hit up the outdoor store, military store. Need some jackets, some boots. Needed a nice big cast iron lid for one of our big lodge cast iron skillets at home. Finally picked one of those up. And Cassie got quite a lovely red pea coat. Then the bad part was we tried to run by Sizzle Pie. Oh man, the place is closed due to fire. Sizzle Pie, interestingly enough, the pizza joint here in Portland. I think there's one in New York. It was started by Matt, who started Relapse Records. So that's pretty rad and we like that. We also spent our Sunday cooking, as I think our Sundays anymore have turned into, let's make a bunch of meals that we can use all through the rest of the week. And I've been making the oatmeal parfaits for the last couple of years, and now we've been making pasta salads and soups and made a couple of quiches. Good times. And again, let your fridge be your medicine cabinet. And hopefully you had a fantastic, productive weekend at home. It is Monday morning. It is September 18th, and Monday mornings are geopolitics. That's world news. All the stories we're going to talk about, we tweeted out an hour before showtime. You can get those stories and the invite to the chat all at the top of the tweets. Hashtag geopolitics is your Monday hashtag. Let's glance at the breaking lamestream news before we dive into all the world news. Another day, another hack. This is news to me. Avast reckons sea cleaner malware infected 2.27 million users. And I do believe I had C Cleaner on my on my computer at some point. I quickly checked on the one. It's not on there. We'll have to look at the older and see if it is in there. Hurricane Maria heads towards Puerto Rico as a major storm. And the Emmys 2017, everything you didn't see on TV, which for us was pretty much everything because we didn't watch that garbage. Early reports are Stephen Colbert's obsession with Trump is starting to get a little bit old. I think it's pretty telling, and we've talked about this on the show before, that early in the year, very, very early in the year, even you two realized, okay, political is just getting too fraught. They got out of it and started 2017 while everybody else was going rah, 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 we hate the president, America's next top president, I just stopped paying attention, just started paying attention, I just woke up after eight years of giving the previous puppet a pass. You two began 2017 by going, hey, you know, we're going to celebrate the 30th anniversary of uh, Joshua Tree. We're going to get out of politics. And I think to further drive that point home as riots break out all in America, you two actually canceled their St. Louis concert over the weekend because of the mass protests due to police brutality. So I think we are in kind of a different spot when, of course, even you two is like, we, we ain't getting into that at all. And the chat says now all you two has to do is just get out of music. Bing! Trump, in you in debt, in you in debut, rather, that's a Freudian slip, I suppose, <laughs> urges the world body to reform as America's next top president goes on the big grand chessboard stage today. And the Flynn family sets up legal defense fund. Those are some of your breaking lamestream news. But let's get the fact check, my friends, because Alphabet Incorporated knows you don't have critical thinking skills. Justin Bieber not caught up in church child molester scandal, despite claim. But we might have to look into that. That sounds like a very Thursday, Friday topic. That comes from Gossip Cop. File that away, somebody. Hillary Clinton says women caved to men in voting against her. That's from Stopes. But I can tell you that's true. I saw the clip. Saw the interview. I watched, I believe I already mentioned last week, that pretty brutal Jimmy Dore takedown of recent Hillary press campaigns. Is there evidence of voter fraud in New Hampshire, as Chris Kobach said? Not really, says PolitiFact. Trump's tax plan and the rich from factcheck.org and Medicare for all. The musical question, does America really want it? From CBS News. 
Those are your fact checks, my friends. And hey, did anything happen over the weekend? Oh, it's, you know, just the constant looming threat of World War III. We begin with breaking news. Another missile launch by North Korea. National Security Correspondent David Martin is following developments at the Pentagon. The missile flew over Japan and landed in the North Pacific after a flight of some 2,200 miles. It was the second time North Korea has launched a missile over Japan, and this one traveled about 500 miles further. The Pentagon's initial assessment is that it was an intermediate-range missile, which never posed a threat to either the U.S. homeland or to American bases on Guam. Will those in favor of the draft resolution? North Korea had been threatening to retaliate for the latest round of sanctions passed by the UN Security Council on Monday. And U.S. intelligence had been expecting a missile launch either today or tomorrow. But this is part of a long running ballistic missile development program, and the North Koreans would likely be conducting these tests in any event. In both launches over Japan, North Korea has been careful to fly over an unpopulated area and in a direction well away from Guam. Still, North Korean missiles flying over an American ally seems to have become the new normal. Anthony? David Martin at the Pentagon with another missile launch from North Korea. Thanks. Oh my gosh, I'm really scared of the Pentagon's vassal state of North Korea, which of course, you know, the, the, the they're as much a democratic people's republic of Korea as Antifa are actually anti-fascist, so of course there's always a lot in the name. Thank God Guam's okay, you guys. Now all those pedophile priests that we reported for, or reported on for you for months, if not years, those guys in Guam are all safe. Oh, you didn't hear about that? Yeah, dozens and dozens and dozens. I think the number is almost in the triple digit of complaints against pedophile priests in Guam. Of course, acting under the cover of the church and under the cover of the military. And if those two things don't really threaten you, they'll get you with their other city-state power, and that's the money power. You know, City of London, District of Criminals, Rome. So let's get two takes from China as the world heats up, and we all are supposed to duck and cover because of North Korea. Chinese officials urged America's next top president on Friday to halt its threats of military action against North Korea and rejected the notion, pushed by the president in recent weeks, that China is responsible for helping to resolve escalating tensions with military threats of its own. The U.S. should refrain from issuing more threats, said Sui Tianka, Chinese ambassador to the U.S. They should do more to find effective ways to resume dialogue and negotiation. Honestly, I think the United States should be doing dot 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 much more than now so that there's real effective international cooperation on this issue. Sui's remarks came after a press conference given by the insanely deranged U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, and National Security Advisor, crazed H.R. McMaster. This is the guy's essentially running the campaign. If you've been listening to the Media Monarchy stream, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, MediaMonarchy.com slash listen, you know we sometimes simulcast the White House press conferences. And of course we put electronic music below them. But yeah, it's it's all the CIA, it's all those front people out running it. They are running the show. The Trump train is filled with neocons and deep state players, as it always has been, just like the previous eight years. So they both warned that the U.S. could resort to a military option following North Korea's latest missile threat over Japan. Haley and McMaster insisted military action is, quote, not what we prefer to do. But a White House spokesman repeated the administration's position that diplomacy is not an option, saying on Friday that now is not the time to talk to North Korea. The U.S. announced its latest round of harsh sanctions on the isolated nation this week, affecting oil, gas, and other exports to North Korea. I believe America's next top president has already gloated about long lines and gas lines. It's working. (laughs) Ha ha ha. We're going to starve that nation out. Kim Jong-un allegedly said Saturday that the sanctions will not stop him from continuing to develop the country's nuclear program in hopes of achieving the equilibrium of real force with the U.S. and make the U.S. rulers dare not talk about a military option. Isn't it funny? All those nations that have nuclear weapons, use chemical weapons, they're all cool. But the nations that don't have them, they're crazy, unstable, failed states that we've got to stop. 
While America's next top president has said in recent weeks that China should do more to stop North Korea from continuing its military tests, a spokesperson for the Chinese Foreign Ministry joined Sui in urging the U.S. to take responsibility for its current tensions with the Kim regime. China not to blame for the escalation of tensions, I'm sorry. China does not hold the key to resolving the Korean Peninsula nuclear issue either. Those who tied the knots are responsible for untying them. That should be maybe the quote of this episode. Trump responded to North Korea's testing of ICBMs last month by spontaneously threatened to respond with more t to more testing with, quote, fire and fury. Alarming the international community and contributing to the growing discord between the new nations. Two nations, rather. Along with China, a number of other international so-called leaders have called for diplomacy as a means to put an end to North Korea's nuclear development. Polls also, oh well, God, should have led with the polls. Polls also show that most Americans disapprove of the president's bellicose approach to the North Korean regime and fears U.S. military strikes against the country. You're not going to lead with that. That's the part you bury down at the end. You're listening to the Morning Monarchy Geopolitics Edition, and it is September 18th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Let's get a little backfire blowback, shall we? Assisting Tehran with sidestepping an ongoing Washington sanctions regime against the country, China opened a $10 billion line of credit intended to finance energy, transportation, water, and other key Iranian infrastructure projects. Following the groundbreaking 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, between Iran and Russia, the U.S., China, France, the U.K., as well as Germany and the U.K., to end its nascent nuclear weapons program, Tehran, in honoring the terms of the unprecedented treaty, has nonetheless seen Washington implement a host of new sanctions against Iran, including asset freezes and limits on global financial transfers. This, of course, is where the real action is. According to the Iranian Central Bank President, Chinese state-owned CITIC, CITIC Investment Company, has opened a $10 billion credit line to several banks in Iran to be used to fund wide-ranging infrastructure projects in the country. This, according to a report by, of course, the Times of Israel. The significant credit line will primarily use euros and yuan to bypass U.S. sanctions. Chinese, or rather the, uh, who's the spokesperson speaking here? Safe indicated that the 10 billion bucks, alongside an additional previous 15 billion of Chinese investment into other unnamed projects in the country, show a strong will for continuation of cooperation between the two countries. So said Pakistan's GOTV. In pledges to significantly increase trade with Iran, Beijing previously opened two credit lines, equaling 4.2 billion dollars, to build high-speed railway lines between Tehran and the cities of Mashhad and If. Isfahan, this according to Iran Daily, also hot on the heels of an 8 billion euro credit between Tehran and Seoul's Exim Bank signed in August. While Western banks remain cautious, particularly as Washington has imposed what many consider to be an unnecessary financial block on Tehran, negotiations are progressing between banks in Austria, Denmark, Germany to provide $22 billion credit line to Iran. So how's that working for you? U.S. sanctions continue to backfire. As our commie friends at Sputnik News reports, China opens $10 billion credit line for Iran. And these aren't the things you're going to hear on your lamestream news. All you get is fear-mongering threataganda about whether the missiles are going to kill you. They don't talk about who funds the missiles, where the missiles came from, who gave them the go-ahead to figure out how to make visible material. It's a game. It's a joke. It's a lie. This is another situation that we shouldn't get emotionally involved in. Now, who of our, you know, of our, of our friends, of our compatriots, of our peers, who among us, if this were a serious threat, and again, I'm not trying to exactly conflate Iran and North Korea, but these are just the sort of geopolitical situations we see playing out that don't get a lot of coverage. If anybody was going to be freaking out about missiles hitting Japan, don't you think our buddy James Corbett might say something about it? Do you think he might put up a report that says, hey, you guys, North Korea might actually blow us up? I haven't seen any of that. 
Let's continue to look at world news on this Geopolitics Monday. And again, all the stories we're talking about you can find at the top of the tweets at Media Monarchy. And again, we appreciate you being in the chat. Keith, Astro, Jake, Gorilla, everybody, thank you so much. You, you want to continue talking about World War III? All right. A Soviet officer who prevented a nuclear crisis between the USSA and the USSR and possible World War III in the 1980s. He quietly passed away at the age of 77. Back in 2010, our other, of course, Russian propaganda outlet, RT, spoke to Stanislav Petrov, who never considered himself a hero, but they're looking at the guy who essentially saved the world. A decision that Soviet Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov once took went down in history as one that stopped the Cold War from turning into nuclear Armageddon. Largely thanks to Karl Schumacher, a political activist from Germany, helped the news of his heroism first reach a Western audience nearly 20 years ago. On September 7th, Schumacher, who kept in touch with Petrov in the intervening years, phoned him to wish him a happy birthday, but instead learned from Petrov's son Dmitry that the retired officer had died back in May, May 19th, in his home in a small town near Moscow. On September 26th, 1983, Stanislav Petrov was on duty in charge of an early warning radar system in a bunker near Moscow when just past midnight he saw the radar screen showing a single missile inbound from the United States and headed towards the Soviet Union. When I first saw the alert message, I got up from my chair. All my subordinates were confused, so I started shouting orders at them to avoid panic. I knew my decision would have a lot of consequences, Petrov recalled, of that fateful night. Again, in an interview with RT back in 2010, the siren went off for a second time. Giant blood-red letters appeared on our main screen saying, Start! It said that four more missiles had been launched. From the moment the warheads had taken off, there was only half an hour for the Kremlin to decide on whether to push the red button in retaliation and just 15 minutes for Petrov to determine whether the threat was real and report to his commanders. Shall we play a game? My cozy armchair felt like a red hot frying pan and my legs went limp. I felt like I couldn't even stand up. That's how nervous I was when talking about when taking this decision. Taught that in case of a real attack, the U.S. would have gone on an all-out offensive, Petrov told his bosses the alarm must have been caused by a system malfunction. I'll admit it, I was scared. I knew the level of responsibility at my fingertips. It was later revealed that when the Soviet satellites took what the Soviet satellites took for missile launch was sunlight reflected from the clouds. In an early example of geoengineering, Petrov actions, however, received zero praise, and he was scolded for not filling in a service journal. His superiors were blamed for the system's flaws, my superiors were getting the blame, and they did not want to recognize that anyone did any good, but instead chose to spread the blame. For over 10 years, the incident was kept secret as highly classified. Even Petrov's wife, Raisa, who died back in 97, didn't know anything about the role her husband played in averting nuclear war. That was until 1998, when Petrov's superintendent, Colonel General Yuri Vontensev, spoke out in a report about the officer's quiet deed appeared in the German tabloid Bild. After reading this report, I was as if struck by thunder, Carl Schumacher wrote in his blog. I couldn't get rid of the idea that I had to do something for the man who prevented an atomic war and thus saved the world. Schumacher flew to Russia to find the man who saved the world and found him living in a flat northeast of Moscow. Schumacher invited Petrov to the German town of Oberhausen so that locals would find out about the episode of when the world was teetering on the edge of nuclear catastrophe. Based on his story, the movie The Man Who Saved the World premiered back in 2014 featuring Kevin Costner. Kevin Costner actually sent Petrov 500 bucks as a thank you for making the right decision. At first, when those people started telling me that these TV reports had started calling me a hero, I was surprised. I never thought of myself as one. After all, I was literally just doing my job. Soviet officer who averted nuclear war has died at the age of 77. And yes, they're calling him in the chat because I was thinking of it the whole time. It's the Russian Matthew Broderick. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy. We're glad you're here. Hopefully it's a fear-free way to look at what's really going on in the world. I'm not selling you any snake oil. I'm not selling you any threat again to fear porn. Independent news and media. We've been online for 12 years and a week now, my friends. Let's continue to look at hashtag geopolitics as we hop over to antiwar.com. The so-called Justice Department has ordered the aforementioned Russia's 
U.S.-based RT News Network to begin registering as Russian foreign agents under the 1938 Foreign Agents Registration Act. The law requires U.S.-based agents of foreign principles to disclose financial information and activities in regular public filings overseen by a designated DOJ officer or even office. Over the years, FARA, again, that's the Foreign Agents Registration Act, has been amended to exclude bona fide news organizations. The Department of Justice order breaks a long period of unfettered access by the U.S., or rather access to the U.S. by foreign press agencies, many directly and indirectly financed by foreign governments. Although RT's viewership in the United States is minuscule, Compared to major domestic broadcast and cable news outlets over the years, RT has made many enemies in Washington. The network slogan, Question More, and financial resources allowed it to televise stories that U.S. networks, under the perpetual threat of loss of access to newsmakers, boycotts, and organized pressure campaigns, cannot. Actually, Cassie and I were just kind of talking about that this morning. Learned many, many, many a decade ago from Jello Biafra that the way they had altered the news agencies within the television networks. They used to treat them differently. They didn't have to, you know, keep it in the black. They were the news agencies, and they know, you don't make money. That's, you just, we, we provide a public service. At some point in the 70s, 80s, all those laws changed, and essentially the news agencies had to start acting like they were just another show that had to get ratings. How do you get good ratings? By telling the truth, you don't tell the truth. Nowhere was this more evident than RT's relentless coverage of Israel and its lobby. RT covered Benjamin Netanyahu's connection to the Arnon Milchin nuclear trigger smuggling ring, the diversion of weapons-grade uranium from a toxic plant in Pennsylvania to Israel, and details of a massive Israeli lobby orchestrated propaganda campaign in the United States. A far order could mean RT's departure from the American scene. This could reduce the number of news packages on topics prohibited in America, located in the triple-digit channel nether region of the cable industry, but archived and well-viewed with 2.2 million YouTube subscribers. They could basically turn that to nothing. With new scrutiny of Russian activities following allegations of meddling, this damn meddling kids in the U.S. electoral process, the FARA order should come as no surprise. The DOJ can be expected to deploy resources far in excess of the meager nine-person team working in the FARA department in order to finally get them Russians. However, RT could attempt to use the tactics of another FARA target, the Israel lobby, to avoid registering. And that is essentially the basis of this anti-war article, asking the musical question, Israel's foreign agents don't register. Why should Russia's? Can Russia use Israel lobby tactics to skirt the Farah order? So basically, RT needs to adopt APAC's moves. And they even break them down here in uh, five points. First one, delay, delay, delay. The American Zionist Council and APAC, which was... The American Zionist Council's unincorporated lobbying committee were ordered by the Kennedy administration to register in 1962. This followed a massive propaganda campaign targeting Congress and the American public funded with foreign money aimed at winning unconditional foreign aid and diplomatic support for Israel. Mission accomplished. So they basically strung along the DOJ until 1965, long enough to orchestrate a paper restructuring of its operations that led to the incorporation of APAC as a separate entity. So delay, delay, delay. Number two, politically pressure the DOJ and political elites into a special exemption, where they talk about, again, the Anti-Defamation League. Janet Reno. Interesting, interesting historical stuff in here. And again, we include the show notes everything we say in play, so you can continue these, these articles yourself. Another point would be to clarify that Russia is not the Soviet Union. I might have to work on that one for a while. Reconstitute and volunteer to spy for the CIA and FBI. Those are the ways that RT could act essentially like APAC. So that gives us our North Korea, China, Israel, Russia coverage on this geopolitics episode of Your Morning Monarchy. But, of course, what would a week be if we didn't look at the Philippines? Briefly, Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte may declare nationwide martial law this week if threatened massive protests by communists and other leftists against his rule turn violent or disrupt the country, his defense chief said on Friday. 
He said, if the left will try to have a massive protest, start fires on the streets, they will disrupt the country, then I might declare martial law. Yeah, those are the anti-fa demonstrations, anti-Philippines demonstrations of Duterte. Another update for you on a story we've been following. As we head back to the Salt Lake Tribune, the controversial arrest of a university hospital nurse wasn't the first time Salt Lake City Police Detective Jeff Payne had faced an internal investigation for violating department policies. Newly released records show about four years ago. Jeff Payne. Now, again, this is the horrific video of the cop tackling the nurse and arresting her. As again, you sort of have the battle of two statists. Who's going to win? The guy with the gun and the roid rage. About four years ago, Jeff Payne received a written reprimand for allegedly sexually harassing another department employee over an extended period of time, internal police records state. And in 1995, Payne was found to have violated multiple department policies related to a vehicle pursuit that involved the Utah Highway Patrol. He was suspended 80 hours without pay. Payne and another officer, Lieutenant James Tracy, have been the focus of several investigations in recent weeks after Payne aggressively arrested University Hospital nurse Alex Wobbles on January 16th, acting on the directions of Lieutenant James Tracy. Wobbles, citing hospital policy, refused to allow Payne to obtain a blood sample from an unconscious patient injured in a fiery crash in Cache County. The resulting arrest drew widespread outrage from outrage culture, troll America, when Wobble's attorney released body cam footage of the encounter two weeks ago. Public documents recently obtained by the Salt Lake Tribune shed new light on both officers' law enforcement careers, covering both the good, the bad, the ugly, including department policy violations and various commendations. So this report rolls on and on. They've actually got embedded in the scribbed document, Salt Lake City Corporation. Salt Lake City Police Department detective who arrested nurse had been disciplined for alleged sexual harassment and other violations. Long career of abusing your position, and that's what they do in the institutions. I can't stress that enough on these shows. Another follow-up for you. Late last year, reports began surfacing that U.S. diplomatic personnel in Cuba were beginning to experience strange and inexplicable symptoms of dizziness, nausea, memory loss difficulty hearing and loss of balance. Initial reports attributed the symptoms to an acoustic attack, but neglected to provide any salient details about the specific nature of the attacks, or more importantly, who might have carried them out. The Cuban government quickly denied any knowledge of the attacks. Fast forward to late last month, when we were starting to cover this story for you, CBS reported that the attacks had caused at least 16 U.S. Embassy personnel to suffer traumatic brain injuries as well as damage to their central nervous systems. The diplomats complained about symptoms ranging from hearing loss and nausea to headaches and balance disorders after the State Department said incidents began affecting them beginning in late 2016. A number of diplomats have cut short their assignments in Cuba because of the attacks. The source says American diplomats have also been subjected to other types of harassment, including vehicle vandalization, constant surveillance, and home break-ins. Now the Associated Press is reporting that two more Americans were affected by the attack, bringing the victim count to 21. And according to one State Department spokesman, that number could continue to climb. The additional two individuals appear to be cases that were only recently reported but occurred in the past. State Department said that no new medically confirmed incidents have taken place since the most recent one in late August. Earlier this month, the U.S. disciplined, or rather, the U.S. disclosed there had been another incident in August after previously saying the attacks had stopped. It's possible the number could grow even higher as more cases are discovered. State Department spokeswoman Heather Newert said the U.S. continues to assess American personnel. Now we're grabbing this report from Zero Hedge, and the U.S. didn't say how serious the newly disclosed incidents were, but the State Department said it was providing the best possible medical evaluation and care throughout the ordeal, including aid from a medical officer on staff in the embassy. As the disturbing incident has unfolded, the U.S. has encouraged its diplomatic personnel to immediately report any strange symptoms. Now, in different times, reporting these sorts of strange symptoms would get you labeled a crazy conspiracy kook as we will see at the end of this episode in this day in history. For now, the U.S. government has avoided accusing the Cuban government of being involved in the attacks. 
Though the U.S. quietly expelled two Cuban diplomats from the country's mission in D.C. shortly before the CBS report, which is widely credited with shining a spotlight on the story, broke. For its part, the State Department has also been unwilling to speculate about the attacks. However, as Hearing Health and Technology Matters, hearinghealthmatters.org, as they explain, it's likely the attacks were either carried out using infrasound, sound below 20 hertz, or ultrasound, sound above 20,000 hertz. Of these two options, Jerry Punch, researcher at Michigan State University, says infrasound, a not uncommon torture technique, was probably the culprit for several reasons, which he explains by saying, Punch told HHTM that compared to ultrasound, infrasound travels farther because of its long wavelengths. It's difficult to attenuate by traditional noise control methods and potentially affects more people because it is broadly distributed. It goes without saying that we would wish anyone, everyone, a speedy and complete recovery for every diplomat affected. But there are some far more significant issues here that could, should be addressed directly. How will these attacks influence Cuba-U.S. relationships? And more importantly, what's being done to hold the parties responsible? While America's next top president in June said that he would cancel former president hope and changes one side deal with cuba in reality the administration has tightened restrictions on trade somewhat but taking little meaningful action little has been said or done since then and now as zero hedge says we wait to see if even more diplomats were and or are affected so as long as we're talking about the secrecy of the Western military industrial complex, the U.S. Air Force has refused to disclose what type of aircraft Lieutenant Colonel Aaron Schultz was flying last Tuesday when the pilot crashed and died. Schultz held a Ph.D. in aerospace engineering from Caltech, an MBA from Pennsylvania State University, flew on 50 close air support missions in Afghanistan and was one of the first 30 pilots to ever fly on the beleaguered F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. All according to that bastion of truthiness, popular mechanics. Further, the lieutenant colonel had also served as a test engineer at the Naval Air Warfare Center. So how exactly did such an experienced and brilliant pilot die during a training run over the one of the U.S. Air Force's most commonly used test ranges? Air Force Chief of Staff David Goldfine said over the weekend, I can definitely say it was not an F-35. Information about the type of aircraft involved is classified and not releasable. But you, you just kind of said that it was one thing and not another. The incident occurred last Tuesday during a training mission roughly 100 miles north of Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada. This is all according to the U.S. Air Force. The aircraft was assigned to Air Force Materiel Command. A military source tells Aviation Week Schultz was involved in a squadron that regularly tests and evaluates foreign jets. Now, I believe I saw, and I don't yet have it on my stack, for Tuesday's news about Cyberspace War, that they launched the X-37B again, I'm pretty sure. Our last few stories here on the Geopolitics edition of Your Morning Monarchy are biggies. And we head to Iowa City, Iowa as the dateline, where the story begins, an Oregon parent wanted details about school employees getting paid to stay home. A retired educator sought data about student performance in Louisiana. And college journalists in Kentucky requested documents about the investigations of employees accused of sexual misconduct. Instead, they got something else. Sued by the agencies they had asked for public records. Government bodies are increasingly turning the tables on citizens who seek public records that might be embarrassing or legally sensitive. Instead of granting or denying their requests, a growing number of school districts, municipalities, and state agencies have filed lawsuits against people making the request, taxpayers, government watchdogs, and journalists who must then pursue the records in court at their own expense. The lawsuits generally ask judges to rule that the records being sought do not have to be divulged. They name the requesters as defendants but do not seek damage awards. Still, the recent trend has alarmed freedom of information advocates who say it's becoming a new way for governments to hide information, delay, delay, delay disclosure, and intimidate critics. This practice essentially says to a records requester, file a request at your peril. Governments turn tables by suing public records requesters. Now, we might have to look at Muckrock for a little bit more on this story. There is a lot to look at in all of these stories. And again, I appreciate and, and 
ask and demand and hope and pray that you'll continue the research on these stories and help us out. And again, follow us up. Reach out. Tweet us. Email james at mediamonarchy.com. So let's see if we can get caught up on another massive story. Last Wednesday, Harvard University announced that Chelsea Manning, who leaked evidence of U.S. war crimes in Iraq to WikiLeaks and was incarcerated for seven years before being pardoned by President Obama, had been named a visiting fellow. Michael Krieger, writing for Liberty Blitzkrieg, says he disagrees with almost everything Obama did as president, but his pardoning of Manning is something that he applauds. Then, however, the CIA complained. The complaint was swift and two-pronged. First, former acting director of the CIA, Michael Morell, wrote a letter by which he resigned in protest. Then, the current CIA director, Michael Pompeo, wrote a note of his own which included support for Morell. Morell's letter is absolutely incredible if you know some of the guy's history, and you can read the entire thing. Again, the link's in your show notes. Towards the end, Morell has the nerve to write, quote, I have an obligation to my conscience, and I believe to the country, to stand up against any efforts to justify leaks of sensitive national security information, end quote. For more on this story, let's head over to the late Joey Ramone's good buddy, Maria Bartiromo. Let's switch gears here. Harvard is rescinding its invitation for Chelsea Manning to become a visiting fellow. Manning was arrested in 2010, you know, for leaking classified documents to WikiLeaks. From a CIA director, Michael Morell resigned from his post as a senior fellow at Harvard in protest of Manning's invitation. In a letter, Morell said this, Unfortunately, I cannot be part of an organization, the Kennedy School, that honors a convicted felon and leaker of classified information. Just hours later, CIA Director Mike Pompeo also withdrew from the post at Harvard, citing, citing Manning as well. He wrote this, my conscience and duty to the men and women of the Central Intelligence Agency will not permit me to betray their trust by appearing to support Harvard's decision. I want to get to you in a second, Bree, but let me bring Jason in here. You're a Harvard fellow. Yeah, I just started last week as a, as a resident fellow. And uh, you know what? I give Harvard a lot of credit for a, inviting me because they wanted to have the full political spectrum uh, represented there. And I thought, hey, as a conservative, it's an opportunity to get in front of what is traditionally a very liberal um, you know, audience and, and folks. And I do think that Harvard really listened on this. There was a call. I was on a call late last night uh, with Dean Elmendorf talking about how problematic that is. And overnight, they made, I think, the right decision and rescinded this. Shouldn't have ever happened in the first place, but I think they really heard concerns from Pompeo and others, and they rescinded. They pulled it back. And, you're you're and happy I with think, the decision. Yeah, they made the, they made the right call. Bree? Yeah. So I think uh, the fact that uh, Harvard didn't think that this would be a problem to give a convicted traitor right. uh, a fellowship. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think it shows how insulated academia has become. And I also think that it speaks to how flawed the topic of intersectionality is, right? This kind of ideology that's plagued college campuses um, that, you know, if you have more victim points, then your opinions matter more than other people, right? And the fact that uh, Chelsea Manning is somehow this hero or this person that you're going to give a fellowship to, I mean, you know, I, I think it's clear that they're overlooking all of the things that she did, all of the lives that she endangered uh, mm -hmm. because of her decision to do this because she's trans. Right. And I mean, it, it, <clears throat> in this way of thinking, uh, intersectionality promotes this kind of behavior where it doesn't matter what you do. We're not going to judge people on what you do on not the content of your character, but on how many victimhood points that you have. And for whatever reason, she being Sorry. a trans woman, you know, gave her more points. And so uh, she so you, was able to be a just, traitor. They and they initially still did it just to be, her. They initially did it just to be politically correct. Right. Well, or, or that they were able to overlook all of this because she's trans, right? Because right. they're so, intersectionality is so ingrained in the psyche of academia. Well, that, goes that, to my point, okay. that goes to my point that you have universities that are more interested in educating people about gender categories and the proper pronoun right. to use than actually teaching young women and young men math and science and things that better the world. Yeah. Period. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, let's give... Yeah, let's give the rat a home at Harvard University when this person uh, betrayed our country. I mean, I don't get it. It, it seems like Thank it's you. all about what race you are. It, it's all about what who you decide to sleep with. It's all about um, if you're an immigrant. It, it's nothing about doing the right thing. It's nothing about uh, you being an actual American citizen. Everything uh, that is wrong about this right. country, they promote on these universities. It's about time they get called out for it. All right, we will leave it there. Oh. 
Then it gets worse after that, y'all. Sorry. So again, that's that's essentially, unfortunately, what passes for discourse. Now let's be clear here. I don't think national security was ever threatened. In fact, it's more of the nationalist security. It's that little happy feeling in your belly that everything America does is fine because they're on our team. Pretty sure she helped release videos that showed the military murdering Reuters journalists and kids and other people. Collateral murder, I believe it's called. If that's the America you're sad about being betrayed, then GTFO. Michael Isaacson, who's an adjunct economics professor at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, has been suspended after tweeting, quote, Some of y'all might think it sucks being an anti-fascist teaching at John Jay College, but I think it's a privilege to teach future dead cops. He was tweeting at Vulgar Economics. He holds a PhD and agree from the New School for Social Research. His interest includes Marxian political economy and post-Keynesian economics. He's a member of International Association for Feminist Economics and Union for Radical Political Economics. John Jay President Carol Mason in a statement said, I'm appalled that anyone associated with John Jay with our proud history of supporting law enforcement authorities would suggest that violence against police is ever acceptable. It should be kept in mind that Antifa is not libertarian. They want to tear down all current society, including private property and capitalism. And because up is down and left is right, and depending on which letter is in the America's Next Top President White House is where you have to go for the news that you get. So, of course, during the previous eight years of the Obama administration, oh, I have to go to the fake right to get anything approaching critical and just like during the Bush years, I had to go to anything approaching left for anything critical. Good God, if you go back to the early years of media monarchy, you'll find so many links to terrible sites like Raw Story and Daily Cost. That's because they were always the only ones talking about it. So, for the latest installment of Academic Kabuki Theater, let us go to Tucker. Well, America is plagued by the specter of fascist violence, and in an ironic twist, these fascists call themselves anti-fascist, Antifa. Whenever conservatives want to speak on campus or hold a rally, Antifa groups are a reliable presence, and they routinely try to stamp out speech using vigilante violence, which they perversely justify as a form of self-defense. Mike Isaacson is a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. He founded the Antifa group Smash Racism DC, and he joins us tonight. Professor, thanks for coming on. Hi, how are you doing? Thank you for having me. So your position, tell me if I'm mischaracterizing this, is f people you define as fascists do not have free speech rights. No. Uh, my position is that communities have the right to defend themselves against uh, groups that actively seek uh, to eliminate members of that community. D defend themselves against violence or defend yes, themselves against, against... against violence? I mean, we were talking about... Uh, no, but, no, but physical violence? So yes, if I physical say, violence. for example... And we're talking about a history, uh, a group that has a history of no, no, not, uh, enacting not, not hate history. crimes. Yeah, no, we're not... No, no, are we going to pretend like we're just... We're, we're suddenly uh, in this ahistorical world uh, where, where oh, uh, not, Dylan I'm, Roof or Way Michael Page doesn't exist, where uh, Anders Bravik doesn't exist? Are you kidding me? No. Are you really a professor, by the way? I, what? Uh, so here's, here's the question, though. Is it past statements that have espoused violence, or is it acts of violence? It's so both. could you... Could you it's okay, both. I mean, we're talking could about... You, hold on. Let me just finish mm -hmm. my question. Could, could you commit violence against me if you thought that I had a history of saying things that you imagined were violent. I, I would never commit violence against you. Um, I actually, when I was younger, I was a libertarian, and I actually looked up to you when you were a libertarian. Okay, but let, let, uh, let's take me out of this. Okay. Let, let's just, I, I want to know, like, the, the, the concept of self-defense is a legal concept, but it's mm -hmm. also got, like, a long sure. uh, history and tradition in common law. So, the idea is if I'm hitting you, if I strike you physically, if I physically commit violence against you, you have a right to commit violence back in order to protect yourself or your property. Sure. But you're seeming to say that anybody who has espoused ideas that have at some point in history led to violence can be the subject of violence from you. You're not saying that. No, I'm not saying that. Uh, what I'm saying is that I believe it is the right for communities to get together to assess what is a threat to them uh, and to defend themselves against that threat. So give me an example. Like what public figure in America right now could be shut down, could have his free speech rights taken away, and could be the subject of violence under the standards you're describing? 
Uh, well, I mean, for instance, I, I think that the framework here of, of talking about violence as opposed to talking about preserving the very freedoms that you and I both enjoy uh, is, is a false one. I mean, ultimately, we're talking about a movement that actively advocates against all the fetters of democracy. Uh, I mean, we're talking about Richard Spencer, who uh, publishes an altright.com, publishes an article uh, on July 28th by a man named Vincent Law, uh, where the headline was, to protect free speech, get rid of democracy. Um, so I, we really okay, have well, to... I, you know what? I, okay, so let's, let's use that example. I disagree with that. I haven't seen the piece, but it doesn't sound like something I'd agree with. It's, it's not. Does Richard Spencer have a right to speak in public? Richard Spencer is a danger to society. When he speaks in public, what he is doing, he is publicly recruiting people to his very violent movement, very violent okay, ideology. So does, 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 does he have a right to speak in public? Well, we'll have to leave that musical question for some other time. Two weenies having a slap fight. The Kabuki Theater of the Phony Left-Right Divide. It's getting boffo box office, you guys. Gangbusters, or any other funny, outdated word that you could use to describe funny, outdated political discourse. Those are your geopolitics stories, my friends, and all those stories will, of course, be found in the show notes. But like always, I really implore you to go check out the hashtag. So essentially, I only pick 10 or a dozen or so stories each morning to talk about from the hashtag, which again is brought to you by you. Not only crowdfunded, but we are crowdsourced. And a huge thanks to our buddy Sean Cathcart. Huge thanks to our buddy Darren over in Liverpool. Huge thanks to Nicole, to the Dealey Lama, to Clint Torres. They've submitted those stories using hashtag geopolitics. There are so many others that we haven't talked about. Again, I essentially make the claim, make the wager, that you'll be more informed spending a week with Media Monarchy than you would ever be by essentially just watching Tucker or Maria. Sorry, Maria. We're going to go out today with brand new music from ex-Vampire Weekend members' debut solo LP. His name is Rostam. We've been playing some of his solo stuff and collabs recently in the Media Monarchy Kingdom, but we'll go out with brand new music from him in just a few minutes. But of course, you know what time it is. This Day in History, September 18th, 1809, the Royal Opera House opens in London on this day. 1851, first publication of the New York Daily Times, which of course later becomes... The Old Grey Lady, The New York Times. September 18th, 1873, as the Panic of 1873, where the U.S. bank J. Cook and Company declares bankruptcy, triggering a series of bank failures. Isn't that always the classic situation? The one thing you walk away from, you realize, I should probably start a bank, not just a regular business. They're the ones who make all the money. <laughs> it almost kind of reminds me as well, back in, back at the commercial radio stations, do you know that they employ pretty well-heeled consultants who fly around and tell you the way that your show should be? They help you sort of formulate the characters. And the one thing I walk away from that, not thinking, oh, how do I be a better character on commercial radio? I think, God, I should be a consultant. What a racket. Sidebar. Continuing to look at this day in history, September 18th, 1927, the Columbia Broadcasting System goes on the air, and we all get to see BS. 1939, Lord Haw Haw begins transmitting pro-Nazi, anti-Allied propaganda. Haw Haw. 1947, the United States Air Force becomes an independent branch of the United States Armed Forces. You know what else happens this day in 1947? Real bad shit. They passed the National Security Act. That's what gives us the National Security Council, the National Security Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the new Cold War. This is when we're bringing over Nazis, and this is where everything really, really, really goes down the toilet, thanks to the old boys and the banksters. September 18, 1960, Fidel Castro arrives in New York City as the head of the Cuban delegation to the United Nations. Past his prologue, 1968, the Hughes... Who, I should say, Magic Bus single released on this day. And in 1970, James Marshall Hendricks died in his London apartment at the age, of course, of 27. His death was from an overdose of sleeping pills. And on this day, September 18th, 1973, future President Jimmy Carter files a report with the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena claiming he had seen a UFO in October 1969. In 1969, Georgia governor and future U.S. President Jimmy Carter claims he witnessed a UFO. 
there have been numerous attempts to explain the sighting. Some have speculated that perhaps what Jimmy Carter saw was some type of weather balloon filled with helium. But aspects of the sighting don't fit the weather balloon theory. Carter sightings filed at NICAP and the UFO Bureau describe the object changing color. It was the size of the moon moving bizarrely through the sky before it disappeared. Oh, Jimmy Carter, the governor of Georgia, graduate from Annapolis, is really only seeing a weather balloon. A weather balloon? Are we back to Roswell in 1947? Weather balloons don't change color. Weather balloons don't hover. Weather balloons aren't that big. This was big. They rise and they don't stay in the sky. Jimmy Carter didn't see a weather balloon. At the time, there is no official explanation given for what Jimmy Carter saw. Even though he can't prove it, the experience of the sighting stays with him. Jimmy Carter is running for president and he's asked on the campaign trail, Governor Carter, will you tell the truth to the American people about UFOs? And Jimmy Carter says, yes, I will. He's going to reveal the truth. In 1977, when Carter wins the presidency, he directs the CIA to release top secret reports on UFOs and extraterrestrial life. The CIA refuses. Just flat out say no to the president, that's really something. Carter tries another way. Jimmy Carter asks the director of Central Intelligence, George H.W. Bush. Mr. Director, can you tell me what the CIA knows about UFOs? And George, consummate professional, says, Mr. President-elect, you have no need to know. The CIA has denied the new president permission to release top secret information to the public. It surprises people to find out that the president of the United States doesn't have access to everything. The UFO secret is a higher level of top secret than you, even though you're the commander in chief. But something mysterious happens. Just as it seems a standoff is on the cards, Carter makes a U-turn retracting his promise to declassify UFO documents and make key reports public. He cites a serious threat to national security as the reason for backing down. But I would like us to go into those files and hopefully make as much of that public as possible. If there's nothing there, let's tell people there's nothing there. What if, if there something. is something there? Well, if there is something there, unless it's a you know, threat to national security, I think we ought to um, share it with the public. Dun, dun, dun. September 18th, 1973, Jimmy Carter files report on UFO sighting. I warned you there in the chat, it was going to get even scarier towards the end of that This Day in History clip as we continue to look at past his prologue. September 18th, 1977, Voyager 1 takes first photograph of the Earth and the Moon together. Pfft, yeah, if you, if you believe in the Moon. September 18th, 1978. The members of KISS all released solo albums. Ace Frehley, Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley, and Peter Criss. On this day in 1978. On this day in 1983, KISS released the album Lick It Up. And on this day in 1987, KISS released the album Crazy Nights. That's your This Day in Kistery. Now we've got more. September 18th, 2001. First mailing of anthrax letters from Trenton, New Jersey in the 2001 anthrax attacks. Oh, that's right. They come from D.C. Oh, that's right. The guy that did it, we said, is dead. On September 18th, 2007, Pervez rather, Musharraf announces that he will step down as army chief and restore civilian rule to Pakistan, but only after he gets reelected as president. Published to MediaMonarchy.com a decade ago today, U.S. develops 14-ton super bomb. And Bush Jr., of course, constantly making the devil sign, this time at a 9-11 ceremony, and even Wonkette covered the story. We file it under the Department of Running with the Devil. Russia says U.S. attack on Iran would be catastrophic. Any U.S. military intervention in Iran would be a political error that would have catastrophic consequences, Ru Russian Deputy Foreign Minister said a decade ago. 
past is prologue. And again, you can see how this Kabuki theater plays out decade after decade after decade, but there's always constantly new suckers at the table who think this shit is real. Finally published to Media Monarchy a decade ago today, Legendary. Police tasered and arrested a University of Florida student when he engaged in a combative diatribe following a question of Senator John Kerry at a student forum. And what was that question about? I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that question was about why John Kerry didn't contest the 2004 presidential election or try and impeach President George W. Bush. And I believe he was also asking and holding up Greg Pallast book. Skull and Bones. Don't tase me, bro, a decade ago, and it's now just a part of culture. Whew. We lay out quite the tales here. And that's your look at this day in history. Celebrating birthdays today, September 18th, Greta Garbo. J.D. Tippett, you might recall as allegedly being murdered by Patsy named Oswald. Legendary singer-songwriter guitarist Jimmy Rogers, P.F. Sloan, the man on the run, John McAfee, born on this day, the late great D.D. Ramone, the still great Keith Morris. It's also Mark Romanek, famed director, Mark Olson from the Jayhawks, Lance Armstrong, and Jada Pinkett Smith all celebrating birthdays today, but we won't put any of those musical folks in, because it's a new music Monday, and to wet that new music Monday whistle... We're going to go out with brand new music today from Rostam, R-O-S-T-A-M. He used to be in Vampire Weekend. Now, the interesting thing about this, and I've noticed this with a couple of other musicians who leave their main band, you realize that they were probably the secret weapon and the one behind the, sta the, the style and sound of the band. As soon as Chris Walla left Death, Death Cab, you hear some of his solo stuff. You go, oh, you're the secret weapon. You're the one doing all the stuff. And what's been Gibbard doing now? Entire cover albums of Teenage Fan Club. When I hear Rostam, and I've heard his collabs, and we've been playing some in Media Monarchy, you hear he's probably the brains of Vampire Weekend. So I'll be very interested to see what, if anything, comes out of Vampire Weekend. Rostam's done solos. Chris Bayo's done solos, one of the other guys done solos, the only guy that hasn't done solo is the front man. So it's a really interesting dynamic when you sort of see who can put their cards on the table. And Rostam puts his cards on the table with his brand new debut solo record. It came out Friday, and it's called Half Light. It's on None Such, and we're going to listen to Bike Dream from Rostam as your song of the day, my friends. And that's how we get started on another week of independent, non-commercial, alternative media brought to you by you. MediaMonarchy.com slash support. That's how you keep us going. That's the Monday World News Geopolitics edition of your Morning Monarchy for September 18th, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato from MediaMonica.com, thanking y'all so much for taking part and reminding you, as always, like Jello Biafra says, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.